Okay, for today we'll talk a little bit about wireless hard security. Um, uh, some of the weaknesses that we discovered and we've been working on uh, for the last um, three months. Um, uh, mainly on the implementation view. Uh, and the focus was on different um, um, products uh, from different suppliers. So I'm not picking on any vendor here. Um, looking at especially um, uh, transmitters, gateways, um, um, uh, network managers, and so forth. So it's pretty much the end-to-end -end implementation of wireless heart. And in this research, what we've done, uh, we've been looking um, at the wireless heart as a protocol, but mainly the way how it is implemented. Um, so as you can uh, know, uh, especially within plants and process control environments, uh, wireless heart is used for different functions. So this is um, on different um, levels. So that can be on monitoring, control, um, and perhaps on safety. So that's make it really very, very interesting. And that was one of the drivers for us to see how this um, can affect the plant, uh, spe especially as uh, wireless heart uh, have an interface directly with the physical process. So um, some of the functions that wireless heart uh, as a protocol um, uh, does is, is looking at temperature, uh, the level, uh, all those kinds of measurements that you can imagine within the plant, uh, which means that it makes it very attractive. And uh, looking at the landscape of the vendors that are providing wireless heart is getting very, very interesting. So um, that makes it also very exciting for us to uh, look at this protocol. Um, so looking at the attack ve vectors that we've been um, uh, focusing on, um, those has been uh, covering different uh, surfaces um, uh, from transmitters to the gateways and to, and to um, the plant uh, DCS or SIS systems. So here starting, um, looking first at, um, let me go back, um, some of the attack scenarios that we've covered, um, for example, uh, for this um, um, condition monitoring system that can have a measurement for temperature uh, or pressure, for example, one of the attack scenarios that we've uh, been working on is how to impersonate a wireless heart gateway, for example. Uh, another scenario that we've been looking for is how did you can attack the gateway also. And uh, as the gateway have also an interface with um, the plant network, and also with the DCS or LSIS, so that makes it also very, very interesting to uh, look at this attack vector. Um, another level that we've been uh, focusing on is also the impersonation of the data, so how you can change the process values, sending some uh, pri primary values or secondary. Um, most importantly, another level that um, we don't have actually the capabilities to go, uh, that level is really the supply chain attacks, for example. So if you know exactly what you want, then you can go after uh, the whole uh, suppliers involved in these environments. And this is where you can go in some kind of sophisticated attacks if you're talking about manipulating firmwares and so forth. Uh, so this, is, this, this part was really out of scope for uh, the research uh, for us. Um, wireless hard protocols is also very attractive since it have different uh, interfaces uh, with the plant uh, network. So this can be from the OPC, uh, Modbus, um, uh, serial interfaces, but there are also uh, a huge level uh, of um, uh, proprietary protocols that are used in these environments, uh, which means that uh, the attack surface can be very interesting. So if you can leverage um, the, those weaknesses on the gateways or on the sensors, then you can help and move from those networks up to the plant floor, for example, and then you can pretty much compromise the plant end to end. So um, I will leave my, um, uh, I'll give it to, to my, my, my colleague Erwin to go um, deeper. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, sort of uh, obligatory slide about the protocol stack that is actually um, what, what, what's hard, why that's hard. Um, of course, you have the application layer uh, on top, which is actually the hard protocol. So it's it's uh, it's basically wireless hard wireless hard is only the layers underneath it, and on top is the the hard protocol. Um, mainly, we've listed here the the many encryption keys that are actually used within wireless hard. We come back to them in more detail. So in the network layer, you have the join key. Uh, you have uh, specific keys for uh, unicasting, broadcasting, and also different keys for network manager and the gateway. 
uh, lower level protocols on the data link layer, we have some more keys, uh, the well-known key and the network key, which we'll discuss in more detail. And beneath it, it's more like the, um, the, um, the channel hopping, which we also get into more detail, um, which is maybe different from other protocols you, you've seen. There's not that many protocols who constantly hop between channels. Um, so um, we, we first are going to have to look at the join phase because that's the initial phase, the way you actually you join a network as a transmitter, you join a network, a gateway. Um, and what you need for that is actually um, a, only a correct join key. And of course, you also need to know the network ID, which is a num numerical ID because you want to join the, the right network. Um, but the rest of the keys are actually handed out by the gateway. So once you have the join key, and we get into that later on, how you could potentially obtain a join key, you actually just authenticate with the gateway. And the gateway will actually hand out the other keys for you. So in the end, basically what you need is a network ID, which you can somewhat compare to an SSID uh, with a, for a wireless network, a Wi-Fi wireless network and you need a join key. So um, once you have the uh, join key and you join the device, you actually need to send as a client certain hard commands. So you have the CMD 0, 20, and 787 commands. Uh, it's actually the first one is the short tag, second one is the long tag, and the last one is unique, unique identifier. And these commands are actually already in the, in the join um, join request already embedded. Um, and how do you get the join key? That's actually, because that's the first thing you need actually to get on the network. Well, of course, if you're just limited, legitimate user, you can of course get it. Uh, but if you're not so legitimate and you actually are a malicious user who wants to get on the network, you actually have different options. Uh, we get into more detail uh, later on, but for now I can tell you, well, there's either uh, default keys out there, which are just in the manuals, or you can look at the transmitter firmware. And um, if you are able to actually capture uh, a join process, um, that same join key can be used to actually decrypt the wireless hard traffic. And then you can ob obtain the session and network keys, which are provided by the gateway to the client. Um, So the join reply is encrypted with the same join key and includes the following hard commands in the, in, uh, the following request format. Uh, sorry about the formatting, it's not completely correct, but I hope you can still read it. So this is, again, hard commands. So the first one, 963, is actually for the session key. Um, the um, second one, 962, is the network key, and 961 is the device nickname. Um, there are actually different priorities within the network as well. So you have the, um, the commands which are the highest priority, uh, which are being used for packets containing network-related diagnostic configuration and control information. You have the process data, which is in the end the information you're after, because that's the information you actually want to alter uh, in any way. But that's encrypted, so we get to that later, how you could potentially get access to that information. You have the normal traffic, which is basically not, uh, it's all the other traffic, which, which uh, is not in any of the other categories, and you have the alarms, uh, which is more about uh, network uh, status information, network event information. So, default keys. Um, these are actually some of the default keys which are publicly on the internet. This is just by scraping manuals from different vendors. So. I mean, it's more, it's, it's, it's more or less like default passwords. You shouldn't be using those, but who knows? Some of the networks out there might be using these uh, default values. So that's the obvious thing to, to look for first. This is very low level attack, uh, like, like low, low skilled attack, I, I should say. But there is actually another option. Um, it turns out we, we looked at uh, several uh, wireless hard transmitters, and it turns out that all of them are actually using a daughter board of the same vendor, uh, which is a system on the chip. So it has, has all the wireless hard features built in. So there's a radio in there, and it runs all the software for, for the wireless hard stack, etc. 
And it actually turns out that the daughter board has JTAG uh, pins uh, on there. And, and, and even better, they're, they're enabled. What you see up here is actually the output from uh, Atmel Studio, which is a development environment that you can use for the, for the chip. And you can see that here is JTAG enabled, and here you see the on-chip debugging is enabled. So not only is JTAG enabled, you can also actually debug the device um, while it's running. So that's very convenient if you want to reverse engineer the firmware. So that's what we uh, have, have done. We actually um, managed to dump the, the firmware of all the devices we, we tested. And um, the, the, all the, the systems we, we've seen are actually based on the same Atmel chip, Atmel Atmega 128, which is an AVR RISC system. And it has a microcontroller and f embedded flash. So there's 128K uh, flash in there, uh, which, you, which contains the firmware, which you can dump uh, using the right tool. Um, I must say that we have not completely succeeded reverse engineering the firmware. I'll show you how far we got till now, but um, this, this is still a uh, work in progress. Um, it turns out that the AV, uh, AVR chips are not the easiest to reverse engineer, and uh, it will take us some more time to get completely uh, to the joint key. But what I can show you now is that actually we've done uh, firmware dumps uh, of the same device with only a changed joint key. And we can actually pinpoint the bytes where the where the join key is is located. So it's it's somewhere in the, in in the red part. So this is one firmware. This is the other one. With only the, the only difference between them is the, is actually the join key that's changed. Um, I must admit this is not the join key in plain text. So what we haven't figured out yet is how this information is actually stored. We're still working on that. But on the other hand, you don't actually need the, that information. If you somehow manage to get access to, to a transmitter and uh, are, you have enough time to dump the firmware, you can actually get a uh, such a daughter board yourself, upload this firmware without actually knowing the key, but you can actually um, interface with your own microcontroller because it has a serial interface, it has an API, so even without knowing what the key actually is, you can still use it to um, become part of the network and join the network. Uh, another thing, if, if, if you want to perform more attacks on these kind of networks, of course, sniffing the network traffic, which is very easy to do on, on Wi-Fi based networks, but not so easy for wireless hard, mainly because there's not that many, there are not that many tools around. Uh, luckily, we found one, uh, I must say, uh, one product which could do that. And um, it's, it's, it's a commercial solution, I have to say, because there's no open source solution out there uh, at, at this time. But it actually allows you, and you can see up here, is actually it has multiple chips on it. Uh, and, and it sniffs on all uh, channels simultaneously. So if you only sniff on one channel, you have to solve the channel hopping. This works around it by just sniffing on all channels. And it actually um, gives you a PCAP, which you, which you can uh, work uh, with. And it only supports sniffing, so no packet injection. So here you can see there's actually a, a Wireshark, dis Wireshark dissector, which is quite basic, but at least gives you some information about the wireless heart uh, packets. Um, another pot potential solution would be to actually use uh, the Atmel uh, Raven USB stick, which is currently supported by Zigbee for, uh, sorry, it's currently supported by Killerbee for capturing Zigbee traffic. And since there is the similarity with the uh, 805.15.4 layer, we, we think we can actually modify this firmware to, to uh, sniff wireless hard traffic. The limitation is that uh, it's only able to do that on one channel for one device. So either you need 16 devices or you need to implement the channel hopping. And um, that will probably require a firmware modification of the, of the firmware running on the USB stick itself. Um, that's something um, that we haven't done yet but might do in, in the future. So once you have um, the PCAP, there's actually a lot of encrypted information in there. 
Uh, you have the different keys. So what they use is the AES-128 CCM star uh, mode. Uh, CCM mode is also being used in, uh, in, in the Wi-Fi or WPA, uh, WPA uh, standards. Uh, and there's the, the different keys again on, on the different layers. So one thing to actually realize is that on the data link layer, it's actually authentication only. It's not encryption. So the data link layer is not encrypted. And the authentication is being done with the well-known key and network key. Um, on the network layer, you have um, authentication and encryption. So there you have the join key, and you also have the session keys. And the session keys are actually unicast keys for the network manager, broadcast keys for the network manager, and, and another pair for the gateway. Um, so this is the data link layer, and like I mentioned before, it's only authentication, not encryption. Uh, the well-known key, uh, what's interesting about the well-known key, I mean, the name implies everybody knows it, but uh, according to the, the wireless heart standard, it's actually randomly generated, and actually it's not that random, because it's actually the Hardcom standard uh, website. Um, so the network key is random and unique upon network initialization. Um, the data link layer, there is actually uh, the message in, in integrity and that's being uh, calculated with uh, the, the AES CCM star. If we look at the network layer, uh, which does authentication and encryption, you actually see that, that the blue part, which is uh, from here all the way up here, uh, is the authenticated part, but it's not encrypted. And the NL payload actually is the encrypted payload. And the message uh, integrity counter is also included with, uh, with that part. And basically, your upper layers of um, of the of the protocol where actually your wireless or sorry your hard commands are are actually encrypted and are in the NL payload. Um, then there is the the nonce as well, which is uh, being used as a replay uh, protection. Um, it, it has several several uh, bits uh, actually, as you can see on the slide, and. It's 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 uh, sequential, uh, sequential. So it's um, there's some protection, but it, it will sometimes also be transmitted uh, the counter actually, the count. Oh, sorry. The counter up here is being used uh, as an input for the non counter that's being transmitted uh, in advertisements as well. So there is some protection, but if you uh, listen to the network traffic, you're able to learn uh, quite a lot about it and. You can guess the rest of, of, of the of the counter. So there's some protection, but it's not perfect. And then, of course, you have the the channel hopping, and um, as I mentioned before, uh, actually the the, uh, the network manager is assigning to a certain client um, a certain channel offset uh, and slots, uh, which can be used uh, for uh, actually. Uh, transmitting and acknowledging within the same slot, and the slots uh, actually are uh, grouped in super frames. So, um, but all of this is in, in control of, of, of the network manager and gateway. Uh, but you need this information if you're actually trying to decrypt the network traffic because you need to look at the right slots and, and the right, uh, right super frames. So for dissecting network traffic, there is actually currently no tool available. So what we've done is actually we used, uh, we extended the Killer B framework uh, because it already supported Zigbee, which has some similarities. So um, it, this was a logical choice to actually, uh, actually to extend. So um, this is some output from the tool. You can actually see the different super frames. You can see the join slots. And uh, you can also see the network ID I talked earlier about. And I actually kind of speed up a little bit because we're quite tight on time. So actually here you can see the, the join request. You can see the encrypted payload, but also the, the plain text. So this is, with a, uh, this is the decryption with a known uh, join key, as I explained earlier, uh, ways how to get the join key. 
And here's the response as well, the join response. And down here you can actually see the NL payload we, we've seen earlier, and then here it's in decrypted form. It's not readable uh, as for us humans, but in here you can actually find the session keys. And um, this is at the moment uh, where we are. Uh, we're not, we haven't fully implemented support for session keys yet. So we, you will see that we need a session key to actually properly decrypt the rest of the information. But the start is here and we, we will continue uh, extending this, this parser and it will actually allow you to decrypt the traffic if you have the join key. Um, some information about spoofing a transmitter. Um, so once you have the information, uh, like the join key, network ID, and the uh, device identity in the long tag, uh, which are the, the hard commands which I discussed earlier, um, if, if you're able somehow to, to um, get the original, uh, uh, shut up the original device, it's not working anymore, uh, you actually uh, are able to rejoin as, as the original device as you can spoof the, the MAC address and then you're part of the network. And then you can maybe start sending the PVs uh, and actually change the process. Uh, this attack, we, we, we succeeded in actually doing it in our lab environment. Um, the second attack, um, which is not fully proven yet, is where you try to hijack an existing um, joint device. So both your, your uh, malicious device and existing device are actually competing against each other because um, they're actually being assigned the same uh, time slots and, and the super frames from the network uh, manager. So um, one thing to overcome this actually um, and, and, and win this race because it becomes a sort of a battle is actually to, to see if you can, um, you can maximize your, your uh, power level by using bigger antennas. So actually you're, you're over, overruling the original device. And eventually um, he, the original device might run behind on, on, uh, for the counter and there is a sort of sliding window for the counter. So eventually you might be able to, to knock off the original device from the network. I must say we tried to test this on our, on our test network, but actually um, the result was at that time that the network gateway was actually behaving strangely, seeing devices that were already switched off. And we actually had to reboot the device, we get it in the same state again. So this has not been fully proven, but we think it's possible if we spend some more time on this. Um, now I hand over to Jalal again for the conclusions. So uh, some of the um, key uh, messages that we took from this uh, research, um, the wireless heart as a protocol is really well designed and, um, and there is a lot of work that has been spent there. Um, but uh, there are some weaknesses that, there that can be um, with uh, enough time and knowledge that can be easily um, uh, exploited. So mainly if, if um, uh, targeting, for example, the transmitter, that's the ideal uh, target that you can focus on. But same apply for the gateways. If the gateway can be compromised, it's really game over. Uh, it's not only from the security perspective, but you can also disrupt some uh, the visibility of the plant. So data cannot be uh, received anymore. So that's, that's where result in a loss of view for uh, the engineering uh, teams. Um, so um, th therefore, there is some effort required here to be um, um, to deploy wireless hearts as a protocol uh, with more security. Uh, this is not only for uh, the design and the standard, but also during the uh, plant life cycle uh, management. So if looking at the key management, for example, how this is done, looking at uh, facilities that have a life cycle of 30 or 35 years. So if you ask an asset owner how, when did you change the, the key, um, then uh, the answer um, probably pretty much is, is obvious. Um, uh, there, therefore, there is a lot of work that needs to be done there. Uh, this is not only for the end users, but also for the manufacturers. So some of the recommendations that we've been um, 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 producing here as part of this result is really looking at those mitigating uh, controls, uh, starting by physical security. Um, if there is no physical security, then um, there is no security out there. But we do believe that in case of um, the wireless and wireless heart, um, physical security is not really, it's not going to fix all issues. So we're talking about if people have antennas and, and, and capabilities, there is a possibility that, that it can reach to your network uh, remotely. 
Um, regular up, uh, updates, for example, for the keys, uh, that's really very important, and implementation of access lists um, uh, if the gateway can support that. So this is something that can be taken care of by uh, both uh, asset owner, but also uh, suppliers. Um, and there are phases uh, within um, um, the process control projects that you can look at the commissioning phase, but also the run and maintain. Don't assume that the keys are uh, changed or something, ask the questions. Uh, make sure that you um, have uh, a solid uh, process for that. Otherwise, you will end up by those default keys that we've seen in slides previously. And between us, uh, we've seen them a lot in a lot of facilities. Um, for the vendors, there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, they're also on the hardware. Uh, secure storage, for example, very important. Um, this is part of the work that we're doing, for example, on um, uh, timber evidence and, and, and so forth. So uh, we will focus more to see what are the weaknesses and vulnerabilities out there, uh, purely to help the, the asset uh, owners, but also the vendors to fix those issues and those vulnerabilities. We're talking here about level that can impact the physical uh, process of your plan. So if something bad happened, um, uh, I mean, the consequences uh, can be really uh, very bad for everyone. Um, finally, uh, like passwords, default keys, make sure as end user and manufacturer within your project change those. Um, that's, that's really the, the key thing that we want to bring here. Um, so for us, the most important part of this research, uh, we have some um, um, uh, very good um, results that we achieved. So starting by the development of wireless hard parser, but we are looking also for ideas for extending the capabilities of the uh, Atmel um, um, uh, firmware to be able not only to sniff, but to have some capabilities for injections of packets. Um, uh, last but not least, um, uh, we're um, uh, committed to work on a wireless heart uh, um, um, uh, fuzzer. So this is a work in progress for us, and we believe that will help the community uh, from asset owners and vendors uh, to fix these issues in the protocol, but also in the implementation. Um, part of this research, we have um, a, a lot of appreciation and thanks for people that helped us and been involved in this work. Uh, um, mainly our colleague, Matthijs, really um, uh, impressive work that he conducted during this research. Um, uh, have been very helpful. Uh, Alex, I'm not sure if Alex is here with us, Alexander Bolshev. Uh, thanks a lot for, for your help and, 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 and tips, and uh, especially for the ABR RA. Uh, and Andre um, uh, Petrut also on the Beam Logic support sniffer. So um, I, I would like to thank you for um, the, 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 the work that you have contributed to this research. Um, this will uh, close our um, uh, session. I think we are exactly on time. Um, of course, we'll be happy to take any questions if, if there are any. Uh, hi guys, uh, you said uh, you'll show something on reverse engineering, like your current state on reverse engineering the firmware or, or the device. Like uh, I, I, I suppose eight slides ago, you said we'll show you the current state, like what what you achieved, like because if you need to fuzz the device, you know, so on, you have to understand what's happening. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if you remember the slide, but I can go back. I, I showed you the the diff, the diff between the two firmware. So basically, what we've done uh, done now is actually pinpointed the firmware. Uh, some of the other things we've done, uh, I had some col uh, contact with Alexander uh, to actually discuss. Okay, how can we reverse engineer this? Because uh, the AVR chip is not the easiest chip to reverse engineer. So what we actually done on, it, on his advice is uh, try to find out which compiler uh, or development environment is being used for that particular uh, firmware. So you could actually uh, find common functions within that firmware. Um, we, we tried several uh, option, uh, different compilers, different optimization settings to match those uh, functions, but we haven't succeeded in that part yet. Another thing we uh, have tried um, only the last few days as um, we actually um, try to debug the device and set a watch point on that key I showed you, on that memory address, to see if that memory address was hit once the key was being read. Uh, the 
issues we had is that we actually came here from the Netherlands and we didn't bring our wild heart gateway as well. So we were here with just the transmitter. So I wasn't able to hit that position uh, in time for, for the presentation. But that's something we're going to continue on. Actually, today we still looked at some of the reverse engineering and we actually found out that we, we were using radar and the version of radar I was using actually contains some bugs. With the help of Alexander, we found out today that's why we, we probably couldn't get any further with the reverse engineering. So uh, that's, that's more or less the status of, of what we've done. I skipped over it a bit because oh. we were running out of time, but I hope oh, yeah, this yeah. gives you some information about I, what we were doing. I, I get it, thanks. Uh, just um, some, some additional, like, uh, okay guys, here you make a ni ni nice diff, but um, isn't the, 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 the device on some common uh, chip architecture like well-known so you don't need to know which compiler is, you know, what's actually the instructions are. Well, what you see out, uh, what we actually have done, we opened about five different transmitters and they all had the same chip. There's actually a newer revision of that chip, which is based on a different architecture, oh. but we haven't seen it in the wild yet. I mean, it, yes, it's out there, but we haven't seen it being used. And that is actually an easier architecture to reverse engineer, yes. Okay. But, uh, Th thanks you very much. Um, I, I, I was, I was, I'm curious because uh, you guys said that you're going to make some Pfizer, uh, and so it's kind of interesting task. And uh, I can imagine like how to make a Pfizer and how to fuzz and how to understand that you really fuzz something nice without knowing what's happening. Like you have, a, I don't know, some some cover. You need to uncover that part. Suppose, yeah. Sure, sure. We, we, we need to do some work, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, uh, pure curiosity, uh, what was the choice behind not using something like the Hack RF, uh, using the other uh, radios, you know, not using the software defined radio? Oh, software defined radio, yes. Yeah. Good question. Uh, we, actually, there are some, some papers out there from, from university students who tried that route and actually had a lot of issues. So, based on that, because you're you're, you're basically, I mean, you have to implement the protocol itself uh, from the from completely, and it, it, it will take you a lot of time to do it. And based on what we saw where other people failed, actually, we said, okay, that's not a viable solution for us. So we looked at different options, and then we found this, this option where you actually it's being done for you instead of doing it all yourself. Okay. Hey, just saw your slide about spoofing. Uh, have you tried the old trick when you reconfigure the sensor device? Uh, not sh shutting it down, but reconfigure it, changing it. Hard long tag and hard identification. After you change it, it will be a new device. Yeah, that's what we actually did by sort of accident because we, we misformatted uh, short tag and long tag. And sure, that, that works, but then it's being seen by the gateway as a different device. And what you eventually want to do is actually mimic uh, an existing device because that way you will be able to influence the PV values without people being able to tell you're actually a spoof device. But when you, if you change the long tag and the short tag and the hard ID of the device, then it will be a new device. Then you will, uh, could create uh, or emulate an existing device by uh, by sniffing the uh, data from the new device and just <laughs> repeating it to the hard gateway, uh, simulating the previous hard ID and hard tag. Okay, so sort of that form a man, man in the middle, that's what you're saying. That, sh that worked with the wired heart. And I think uh, because uh, the standard didn't change it, that definitely should work with wireless heart. Okay, well, that's very good to know. We haven't tried, but thanks yes, for, uh, yeah. Yeah, I have a question about um, those private keys that you have found out uh, while the reverse engineering. So did you try to contact to the different vendors and who makes the ICS devices and what was the result? So we, we are in this, uh, unfortunately we cannot share a lot of information here, but we are already in contact with the vendors and the response from them is, is very positive. So they are very interested to cooperate and work with us on this. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I had one more for you. The uh, the the key management. You you'd said you know encryption best practice is uh, not to use the same key for thirty years, but to expire it 
after a period of time to change it. Are there mechanisms for that in these devices, or is this still a, a gap? Definitely, there are uh, vendors that have part of their uh, gateways um, uh, features that can generate um, um, uh, or generate new keys on a regular basis. So that that's the option is there. Unfortunately, it's just implementation. So that's that's something that can be fixed if this control or these features in it.